Go ahead and take 10 seconds now to write down these two questions if you haven't already done so. And then after that, you can share with your team. What is it that you know memorized word for word? What's something that you know you'll be sharing that out in about 10 seconds? Just go go to write down the summary here. Then we're going to watch this video, and you're going to just summarize three main points. So I need to write, summarize three points. And then do you agree or disagree? Those are the only two things you really need to write down. The rest just kind of helps you think about what that means. Just write those two things down. Summarize three main points. Wait, you want us to write number two down? Number two and three. Just write. Get, get ready to go with those. Yeah, at least. Uh, okay. Okay. Just in your warm ups. Yesterday, the agenda underneath that. Or if you need to, a new piece of paper. The warm ups that we do every day. Did you do the agenda on your student handbook, maybe? All right, share your little uh, little memorization thing with your team. Go. You have one minute. You don't watch TV, YouTube, songs, something like that? No. Maybe. If that's all you got, do it. Go for it.
you notice or maybe you didn't even try to memorize it but it just seems to be I don't know stuck there somewhere in your head you didn't even realize you were attempting you know like with school you have to do flashcards remember stuff but gosh you have so much knowledge that you just kind of that you kind of just know right except for Josh who says he doesn't know any of those commercials it's kind of a cool thing kind of interesting kind of different but all of the rest of us seem to have something I see uh, like like this table right here, what do you guys what do you guys have for your steak fork? Okay, what is the steak fork commercial? What is it? Or what's the what's the line? You don't have to sing it, but <laughs> unless you want to, you get some extra credit for that. Like a, what was the thing? Sing the jingle. That that like any good neighbor, State Farm is there. Kinda. Ah. Oh, okay, Josh, Mister, I don't memorize it. Oh yeah, I know that one. Like any good neighbor, you like do it all like operatic. You know it. All right, put plus two on your paper. These guys over here, what's your what's your commercial? Anything. All right, that's all right. Which one do you, one of you know? What is it? Are you a little, little nervous about it? It's hard to sing, huh? What does it say? Shh. You guys, he's trying to talk right now. Yes, he did. He just did. The State Farm one, what did you do? Aggressive. You did the State Farm one? No, oh, you. No, you didn't. You're just, you're just nervous. All right, what about over here? I'll let this slide now. What was one of them that you guys... We talked about it, right? Um... <laughs> What's the in and out? Do you want me to do it or do you need to do it? That's what I have. No? Oh, yeah, you remember that? Oh, that was a good one. Okay, put plus three in your paper. Thank you. You guys are nervous. All my other peers are like, ah -ha! and they're like getting all ready to sing. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Six, six, you green light. Yeah, I know that one too. All right, good. Put plus three in your paper. Good, I know that one. What else? What else? What else? You got your table. Nothing. You don't know anything. Well, she's still. All right, I'll let it. Stay far one. All right, what do you guys got? Yeah, let me hear. I want to hear Isaac. Everyone, listen up. Say it again. You gotta say it like with confidence. <laughs> That's the point of having Viagra is confidence. You're at the age where you know what you're made of. Choose Viagra. Right. Uh, you, you ever see them? The, the, uh, this is Bob. And he's like, Oh, yeah. He's like, Hi, I'm Bob. Bob's got a lot of confidence these days, right? It's this like, pill that doesn't really do anything. It's like a placebo, but boy, it gives you confidence. Uh, Enzyme, natural male enhancement. All right. So it like kind of grows up. Okay, but that that you can learn that kind of weird stuff because that's all over the place. People trying to sell you a product. Okay, what is this? What do you got up back here? Lucky Charms. What's that? Take a video underwater. Do you know all the, the names yes, of the marshmallows? I know. Do you know the marshmallows? Yeah, you do. See, so you try it. You're like, yeah, but what are all the marshmallows in, in Lucky Charms? Go ahead. Heart stars and horseshoes. No, heart stars and horseshoes. Heart stars and horseshoes. Covers and balloons. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know the rest of it. Very good. Put plus three on your favorite one, you guys. Yeah, everyone knows that one. Here's a, here's one I remember. I don't know if it's still around the mattress one, the mattress guy. Uh, you killing me with that guy. You killing me with that guy. Well, me and anyone's advertising your mattresses. Oh, yeah. All right, that good thing. All right. There you go. All right. Write down one of those if you haven't already done so. Uh, today, today is Life Hack Wednesday. So one of the things I wanted you to know about this, or at least personal application, is Mildred's got three television screens, and she needs a fourth one because she doesn't want to be where she's at. It's sort of like an escape thing. And without even recognizing it, when we watch television or you go on YouTube and you enjoy some of those weird cat videos or whatever you're doing, there's, I don't know, I'm just saying. There is ways in which people or those images get in our brains in ways that we didn't ask for. It's kind of a weird thing. So just know that when things 
we watch it, you guys already know, you know exactly. When I start saying it, you know that how to finish it. And I know all of you have something memorized like that. You didn't even realize it was there until it comes out at random times or random thoughts. You have a brain that can memorize lots and lots of information, better than any computer. And so sometimes we use it just to memorize nonsense that we hear, little jingles that are meant to keep us focused on certain things. Now, this video here, and you should have already written this question two down, summarize three points, is called The Science of Television Watching. It's a very simple, quick video. And there's going to be some points that I want you to write down. So when you see it change to po a different points, see if you can identify what those points are, and then we'll talk about it in a second. So let's let's watch the video here real quick. Get it going. Two plus two is four. And uh, oh, turn off the lights, please, for me. Watch this real quick, and we'll look at what television does to our brains. A little life hack for you, so that you know what to what to think about, how to prepare yourself for television watching. Seventy-five percent of the commercial network television time is paid for by the 100 largest corporations in North America. Some corporations have television budgets that range into the billions per year. Television producers compromise and end up mitigating their desires for those of the advertisers. Thus, television is effectively a private medium for their use only. person watches television, the more easily the brain slips into alpha level, a slow, steady brainwave pattern in which the mind is in its most receptive mode. Images and suggestions are implanted directly into the mind without viewer participation. I don't see a lot of An effective hypnosis is induced, points. and the viewer surrenders to the unending like television image stream. of television violence stimulate the fight-or-flight instinct. But since it would be absurd to react to television violence, the viewer suppresses the emotion. Viewers are drawn back and forth on cycles of impulse and suppression. When the set goes off, the stored-up energy bursts forth in frantic behavior commonly associated with childhood hyperactivity. Television imagery is jammed together in a steady stream of information, fracturing your attention while condensing and accelerating time. These events would not happen in ordinary life. They are technical alterations only possible within the moving image media. Living in the rapid world of television imagery, ordinary life is dull by comparison, and often far too slow. People who are immersed in the surrogate reality of television life deal on a daily basis with a reality totally unlike any that has preceded it. The image stream is a steady, mixed-up stream of real, unreal, and semi-real events. All of these events end up merging with each other and becoming just another set of stored imagery that have all similar reality values. Let's summarize those together so that we don't finish the rest again. What are some of the uh, the main points that it was showing in that video? You all look kind of like passive, by the way, just like the video suggested. Ironically. Okay. So what 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 are some of the points that it that it was discussing about the nature of television? Yeah. Okay. What about wealth? So not just the word. I want you to unpack it. What did it say? Summarize it. How they use the television to help boost their products and information, like how you know about it. Josh, who uses it? What did it say? Who uses television? The, the, so there's like, there's a, 
Like wealthy, not healthy. So there's there's a group of businesses that use most of what you see on television to push a product to advertise to. Do you ever notice that there's some products in reality shows that are blurred out, like t-shirts, and others that are seem to be conspicuously placed, like on American Idol or something, they have like a Coca-Cola can where you can see it. Okay, what do you think that means? Coca-Cola pays for American Idol. You have a Coca-Cola funding and saying, hey, these people who are on your reality show, they happen to drink this particular alcohol, or they happen to drink this particular Coke, or something like that. And it pushes a product. So, one of your summaries needs to be something about how television, how many percent, did you hear the, the data point that they had about it? Good, who said 75? Put plus three on your paper, 75%, so that's your thing. 75% of television is actually controlled by people who want to push a product. So this just isn't to say that it's bad, it just means that know about it, be aware of it so that you're not going, man, I really want Coke right now. <laughs> Coca-Cola, not like the, all right. But you're like, I really want something you know, to drink, I feel thirsty. You, you wanna learn to control the things that are trying to be pushed at you. Number two, what was another summary point? Confusion. What did it say about the nature of watching? You said confusion. Uh, pacifies. Confusion and pacification. Those are actually very good words. Write those down for your points. So you can do those. Confusion and pacification, or, or, or being passive as a as the uh, watcher. Confusion is more about when you see something like horrible or some sort of violence, and your brain and your nervous system react. How do they react? Say it again. <laughs> you kind of start yelling at the TV, is that what you did? Start freaking out, you start interacting with it as if it were uh, <laughs> real. Make you hyper is what it said. How many of you guys like horror movies or like films that are just like scary, that make you feel, ah, uh, yeah. So we like that because it's literally turning our nervous system on in a certain way. It's called fight or flight, so write that down is one of the things. If you look, watch a lot of violence, it makes us feel good in some strange way to watch violence because it interacts with that fight or flight. It stimulates, like a drug. So we like watching this. It's all science, guys. It's life hacking right here to know the science behind why you like horror or why you like violence. Now, if you're a child and you're watching sustained violence, either in person, which would be horrible, but on television, which we think, oh, this thing, that can't hurt him. It may not come out as a violent behavior, but they suggest that it comes out as a hyperactive behavior, perhaps a reason why some students have attention deficit, some of you might be ADD, and it might be correlated to the use of, or the overstimulation of television. That fight or flight constantly being moved, it's conflicting between saying, oh, this isn't right to think this, but I feel this way because I'm seeing it. So we're not used to doing this kind of long-term images that are coming at us fast. So again, be aware. Maybe don't watch as many of those kinds of things as you were previously used to. It might also dull your ability to have an instinct uh, work correctly. If you were actually in a fight or flight and you're used to pressing it because you only see it in videos, you might not be ready for it when it happens, when you actually need to move or do something. Or when someone gets shot in front of you or something horrible and you need to be ready to respond, you might not be ready for it because you're kind of not ready to, to use that fight or flight mentality. Why is there talking over there? Isaac, whoever's throwing books around, just stop. Okay? There'll be time for books in a second. Third point, uh, I heard pacification. When you sit there, you're watching TV after a long day or whatever, and you just kind of start chilling out and letting your, the images come wash over you. I'll watch TV all the You get pacified. That's what his word was. What does that mean? Um, you know, you're not exa you don't exactly feel like doing anything, you just want to sit there and just like stare at the screen. Yeah, you kind of start getting that laziness or that feeling of, wow, I'm just kind of there letting it wash over me. When that happens, it's actually a brain thing. Your brain goes into like a dreamlike state. They call it a hypnosis, but it just means that it doesn't, I don't have to work at all to get images and information. That's why all of you at some point were able to memorize what? Commercials. You see them enough, and you don't realize that you're memorizing what you are. Because your brain is taking that information without your permission. And so at that point, the only thing that you need to do for your life hack is to just say, wow, I, I heard that. I know that they're repeating it on purpose. Do I want to keep this in my long-term memory? Or do I want to, you know, know that it's there? I mentioned the other day that I 
uh, my parents watch TV like all the time. It's like all they do. It's always on, even when they're not watching it. You guys have TV, uh, houses like that? Yeah. It's like seems to be just always on, loud, and people are talking over it like they don't even hear it. I got used to that, and then I left the house for years, and then like every time I visit or whatever, and I don't have that, my house is quiet. Unless I want to go and, you know, internet or watch a movie or something. But when I go over there, it's like, I can't think. It's like, blah, 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 blah. It's like all those commercials and things. And I just like, I turn that off. Like, stop, stop, stop. That hurts my ears. Okay, but you get used to it. And you start internalizing all those things. So just know, just be aware. That's what I'm trying to say about television. Our character, Mildred, again, she's got these televisions all around. And she's allowing it to control her long-term memory. Uh, her, her emptiness, all those kinds of things are a result of her need for stuff and for the lack of substance that comes with television. What's the difference between TV and books? Um, one of when them has no commercials. Yeah, yeah, one you watch and one you read, but what's the difference literally between watching and reading something? Yeah. You have to stimulate something in your mind and read it. There's no, there's, it's really difficult to go into a, what they call an alpha wavelength with books, meaning a dream state. It's really difficult. You have to be really good at reading in order for it to wash over you in the way that you can easily see images. You all learn how to process images before you learn to read. So reading is a different way and a more active way to seek information, to understand the world, to construct your own imagination instead of it being told to you or creating long-term memories for you. That's why it's hard to read, why you don't like it so much. It requires activity, active brain. It feels good when you activate the brain a little bit. Yeah. You don't get commercials. And you don't get commercials. You can always stop whenever you want. That's actually a great point. Foot plus two and like commercials. And also you put plus uh, two for telling me what active versus passive stuff. Uh, we're going to watch at some point in the future a news channel and its presentation of the news versus a news article and how you would read it and how the differences feel in the way it's delivered versus when you read it and how it changes the information. We'll do that in the future. Let's go to turn now. Uh, and, and open up your reading notes. You have your notes available. You need two notes today, two vocab as always. Make sure you get that going. Uh, and we're on page, it looks like 27. And 31 in the, the book with fire on it. 27 in my book. And 31 in. Okay, after class, right after class. I get it printed out. Get the lights off for me, please. Thank you, thank you. All right. We're on the green light setting. All right, cool. So uh, we just learned about in, in a mechanical or an impersonal antagonist. What is that machinery mechanical thing that we just learned about? Yeah. The hound, right? It's this eight-legged sort of spidery thing with, with an injector proboscis needle. It's probably, is it used to burn books? Nope. Do no. books need painkillers? No. no, what did we say it was? It was for the people. This is their way of pacifying a society. You have an assassination kind of thing that keeps people safe from bad people. A mechanical police officer. Would you feel safe with a mechanical police officer? No. Well, as long as it's a bad person, right? And as long as it maintained, you know, a strict... Rule set setting, it would go only after bad people, wouldn't it? So this is a little bit of that thought experiment. Hmm, would I want to be living like that? Now, with the hound, Captain Beatty is saying on the top of 27 that there should be nothing for you to worry about. But Montag is guilty about something. I have a ventilator grill just like Montag keeps remembering right here. And he keeps thinking about this as part of his, his guilt. He thinks about what's behind his ventilator grill at home and that he might be feeling guilty for some reason. And that's why the mechanical hound is starting to pursue him a little bit. So top of 27, uh, the captain uh, says, uh, who would do a thing like that, referring to the hound and why someone would cause it to go after Montag. He says, you haven't any enemies here, guy. Well, none that I know of. Well, have the hound checked out by technicians tomorrow. But this isn't the first time it's threatened me, said Montag. Last month, it happened twice. Uh, we'll fix it up, don't worry. But Montag did not move and only stood thinking of the ventilator grill in the hall at home and what lay hidden behind the grill. If someone here in the firehouse knew about that ventilator, 
then might they tell the hound? The captain came over to the drop pole and gave Montag a questioning glance. I, I was just figuring, said Montag, what does the hound think about down there nights? Is it coming alive on us, really? I mean, it makes me cold. He doesn't think anything we don't want it to think. Well, that's sad. I mean, because all we put into it is hunting and finding and killing. What a shame if that's all it can ever know. You know those, like, dogs that are sort of attack dogs or... Like police dog? Kind of like a police dog, but probably more... I'm thinking more negative, like a, like a dog for fighting or something like that. Oh, um, you mean like the Rottweilers? Rottweilers, yeah, like dogs that are sort of trained. So all they know is uh, death and fighting. Is that a good life for them? No. Beatty snorted gently. <laughs> Hell... It's a fine bit of craftsmanship. It's a good rifle that can fetch its own target and guarantee a bullseye every time. Well, that's why, said Montag, I wouldn't want to be its next victim. Why? You got a guilty conscience about something? Montag glanced up swiftly. Beatty stood there, looking at him steadily with his eyes. And while his mouth opened, and he began to laugh. Very softly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days. And as many times he came out of the house and Clarice was there somewhere in the world. And once he saw her shaking a walnut tree and once he saw her sitting on the lawn knitting a blue sweater. Three or four times he found, uh, he found a bouquet of late flowers on his porch. Or a handful of chestnuts in a little sack. Or some autumn leaves plumped uh, neatly in the sheet. Every day Clarice walked him to the corner, and one day it was raining, the next it was clear, the day after that the wind blew strong, and the day after that it was mild and calm, and the day after that the calm day was like a day of the furnace of summer. And Clarice was with her all sunburnt by late afternoon. Why is it, he said one night, or one time at the subway entrance, I feel like I've known you so many years. Because I like you, she said, and I don't want anything from you, and because we know each other. You make me feel very old and very much like a father. Well, now you explain, she said. Why haven't you any daughters like me if you love children so much? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you're joking. Well, no, I, I mean, he stopped and shook his head. Well, I mean, it's my wife. Uh, she, she just never wanted any children at all. The girl stopped smiling. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were having fun at my expense. I'm a fool. No, no, he said. It, it was a good question. It's, it's been a long time since anyone really cared even enough, enough to ask. It's a good question. Well, let's talk about something else. Have you ever smelled old leaves? Don't they smell like cinnamon? Here, smell. Well, yes, it is like cinnamon in a way. She looked at him with clear, dark eyes. You always seem shocked. It's just I haven't had time. Did you look at the stretched out billboards like I told you? <laughs> I, I think so, yes. Your laugh sounds much nicer than it did, does it? Much more relaxed. He felt at ease and comfortable. Why aren't you in school? I see every day wandering around. Oh, they don't miss me. I'm antisocial, they say. I don't mix. It's so strange. I'm very social indeed. It all depends on what you mean by social, doesn't it? Social to me means to talking to you about things like this and she rattled some chestnuts that had fallen off the tree in the front yard. Or talking about how strange the world is. People, uh, being with people is nice, but I don't think it's social to get a bunch of people together and then not let them talk, do you? Did we already read this part? No. Okay, so my fourth part, perfect. Um, thank you, you're talking, ironically. You guys have class where you just don't talk at all? Yeah. No. Shh. Shh. All right, so you're like supposed to talk and then I don't just, you know. Shut up, it's my turn. Uh, so, hey, respect, respect, respect. Uh, an hour of TV class. Nice, have that TV class going. If only all of our information could just be done by TV. My science teacher was Bill Nye, the science guy in the sixth grade, and the seventh grade, and the eighth grade. That's all we watched. We watched just oh. TV. Oh. Sand, did you know Sand is great? It's just like random stuff that Bill Nye did. Now, Bill Nye's great, but it would be nice to have a real teacher. All right. Uh, an hour of basketball or baseball or running, another hour of transcription history. Hey, take down these notes. This is all you need to know. And it's what I say is right. Write it down. Don't write that down. Uh, or painting pictures. You guys are all confused. Wait, am I supposed to write that down or not? Wait, write it. I'm pantomiming a teacher that just tells you to write down oh, okay. what I think is right. So you write down what I think is right right now. <laughs> 
Sometimes I do say the deal. <laughs> you may write down the quote if you'd like on page 29 in this book. Because yeah. uh, you need to do two quotes today. We never ask questions, or at least most don't. They just run the answers at you. Bing, 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 and us sitting there for four more, uh, for four more hours of film teacher. That's not social to me at all. It's a lot of funnels and a lot of water poured down the spout and out the bottom and then telling us it's wine when it's not. They run us so ragged, by the end of the day, we can't do anything but go to bed or just go off and, and play somewhere where you can destroy stuff, fun parks. You can bully people there. Like you go play, what are some of the modern day fun parks? Obviously you don't do a whole lot of like beating people up in real life like fun parks. This is the 50s so they don't have something you guys have. Can you go and do something wherever you want if you want to? If you want to drive over someone with your car, what can you do? Oh, that's fun. Oh, that's fun. I think this is a GTA, GTA, GTA 5. Who said that? Yeah. Did you say that? Yeah. Put plus three in. Right. <laughs> go, go, go online. Do whatever you want. That's what he's saying. Go play a video game. Go play your Xbox One and bully people around, breaking window panes, uh, destroying wrecking cars in the car wrecker with a big steel ball, or go out in the cars, race on the streets, trying to see how close you can get to lampposts, playing chicken and knocking hubcaps. Are you reading to yourself? Just wondering if it's going on. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. It's going to start making me feel weird, so. Um, you got, uh, oh, 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 1950s. Lots of stealing of cars going on. Kids your age. Just to let you know. So that's what he's thinking about. Bunch of hooligans. Bunch of hooligans, yeah. It's like this old man talking about hooligan children. These hooligans, they're racing and they're Grand Theft Auto. Uh, do you know I'm responsible? I was faith and I needed it. And I do all the shopping and house cleaning by hand. Josh, Isaac. What? What? But most of all, she said, I like to watch people. Shh. Sometimes I ride the subway all day and look at them and listen to them. And I just want to figure out what they are and what they want and where they're going. Sometimes I even go to fun parks and ride in the jet cars when they race in the edge of town at midnight. And the police don't care as long as they're insured. As long as everyone has 10,000 insurance, everyone's happy. Doesn't matter if you die, as long as you're insured. Someone gets paid, that's what life's about. Make sure you get paid. Sometimes I sneak around and listen in subways, or I listen at soda fountains. And do you know what? What? Well, people don't talk about anything. Oh, they must. No, not anything. They name a lot of cars or clothes or swimming pools mostly and, saw how, and say, how swell. But they all say the same things. And nobody says anything different from anyone else. And most of the time in the caves, they have the joke boxes on. And the same jokes most of the time, or the musical wall lit, and all the colored patterns running up and down, but it's only color and all abstract. And all the museums, have you ever been all abstract? That's all there is now. My uncle says it was different once. A long time back, sometimes people uh, said things, uh, pictures said things, or even showed other people. He's, uh, Bradbury's referring to works that looked like this back in the 40s and 50s. Take a look at that. You like that? No. That's kind of cool, right? But what is it? Um, it's color. It's lines. It, like it doesn't mean anything other than the principles of design. There. So this is from uh, an artist named Kandinsky. This work here has a little bit more representation. What is it? What do you think it is? Feathers. It looks like kind of like feathers, doesn't it? It looks light and airy, kind of moving in a direction. It's called the dynamism of a cyclist, like a bicycle person. You see a bicycle person? No. Yeah. Bicyclist? Yeah. Oh, it's going in this direction, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, well, we have abstractions. Now, you can see... Bradbury might be criticizing this a little bit as being too not real art. Okay, and you can make your own decisions about that. Because I tend to like this stuff, but Bradbury does. So he's making a connection. Everyone doesn't draw anything real. They're just doing, they're not showing real people. Oh, your uncle said, your uncle said, your uncle must be a remarkable man. Oh, he is. He certainly is. Well, hey, I gotta be going. Goodbye, Mr. Montag. Uh, okay, goodbye. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven days, the firehouse. Montag, you shin that pole like a bird up a tree. Third day, Montag, I see you came in the back door this time. The hound still bothering you? No, no. Fourth day, Montag, a funny thing, heard tell this morning. Fireman in Seattle purposely set a mechanical hound to his own chemical complex and let it loose. <laughs> hey, what kind of suicide did you think that is? Five, six, seven days, and, and then... Oh. Fixed it. Okay. No worries. Your magic. Thank you. And then Clarice was gone after the seventh day. He did not know what there was about the afternoon, but it was 
not seeing her somewhere in the world. The lawn was empty, the trees empty, the streets empty, and while at first he did not even know he missed her, or was even looking for her, the fact was that the time he reached the subway there was a vague stirring of disease in him. Something was the matter. His routine had been disturbed, a simple routine, true, established in a short few days, and, and yet... He always turned back to make the walk again, maybe, to give her time to appear. He was certain if he tried the same route, everything would work out fine, but it was late, and the arrival of his train put a stop to his plan. The flutter of cards, motion of hands, of eyelids, the drone of the time voice in the firehouse ceiling. 1.35, Thursday morning, November 4th. 1.36, 1.37 a.m., a tick of the plane cards on the grease tabletop. All the sounds came to Montag behind his closed eyes, behind the barrier he had momentarily erected. He could feel the firehouse full of glitter and shine and silence of brass colors, of the colors of coins of gold and silver. The unseen men across the table were sighing on their cards, waiting 1.45. The voice clock mourned out the cold hour of a cold morning of an even still colder year. Now what's wrong, Montag? Montag opened his eyes. A radio hummed somewhere. War may be declared any hour. This country stands ready to defend its... The firehouse trembled as a great flight of jet planes... whistled a single note across the black morning sky. Montag blinked. Beatty was looking as if he were a museum statue. And at any moment, Beatty might rise and walk about him, touching, exploring his guilt and self-consciousness. Guilt. What guilt was that? Think about the ventilator. He's got something behind that. Your play, Montag. Montag looked at these men whose faces were sunburnt by a thousand real and ten thousand imaginary fires, whose work flushed their cheeks and fevered their eyes. These men who looked steadily into their burning black pipes, their platinum, their platinum igniter flames as they lit their eternally burning black pipes. And they had their charcoal hair and soot-colored brows and bluish ash-smeared cheeks where they had shaven close. But their heritage showed. Montag stood up, his mouth opened. Had he ever even seen a fireman that didn't have black hair, black brows, a fiery face, blue steel shaved but unshaved look? These men were all mirror images of himself. Were all firemen picked then for their looks as well as their proclivities, the color of cinders and ash about them, the continual smell of burning from their pipes, get all this imagery down. Captain Beatty there, rising in thunderheads of tobacco smoke, lots of atmosphere, the smoke. Beatty opened a fresh tobacco packet, crumbling the cellophane into a sound of fire. Montag looked at the cards in his own hand. <clears throat> uh, I've been thinking. About the fire last week, about the man whose library we fixed. You know, what happened to him? Well, they took him screaming off to the asylum. Well, he wasn't insane. Beatty arranged his cards quietly. Any man's insane who thinks he can fool the government and us. Well, I've tried to imagine, said Montag, just how it would feel. I mean, to have firemen burn our houses and, and, and our books. We haven't any books. Oh, I mean, but if we did have some. You got some? Beatty blinked slowly. No. Montag gazed beyond them to the wall then of the type list of a million forbidden books. Their names leapt in fire, burning down the years under his axe and his hose, which sprayed not water but kerosene. No. But in his mind, a cool wind started up and blew out the ventilator grill back at home, softly, softly chilling his face, and then again, he saw himself in a green park, talking to an old man, a very old man, and the wind from the park was cold, too. Montag hesitated. What? Was it always like this? I mean, the firehouse, our, our work, I mean? I mean, well, once upon a time. Once upon a time, Beatty said. What kind of talk is that? Answer his question, what kind of talk is that? Once upon a time. It's a story, it's how you start a story, right? A fairy tale story, right? So he's like, oh, okay, this just seems a little different. Once upon a time, what kind of talk is that? You might be reading books. So he's kind of giving himself away in his guilt. Uh, by the way, if you wanted to ask, it's kind of an important quote or something that might be interesting to Montag's development. 
At the very top of 34 in this book, I'm not sure in the other fire book, but it says, uh, he asks a question. He says, I've tried to imagine just how it would feel, I mean, to have firemen burn our houses and our books. You can just write that. Um, that he, he's asking a question. How, um, how it would feel to have firemen burn our houses and our books. One of the first things you learn when you learn right and wrong is, well, now, how do you think it makes them what? Feel when you do that. Good. Plus two. How does that make you feel? And it's a simple little kindergarten thing, but it's pretty profound how easy it is we can neglect that when we have a sense of authority over someone else. These firemen have the ability to harm people in their property. So now he's asking questions, sort of like how Clarice has showed him to do. So tell me what that means and why you think it's an important quote the first time we hear Montag ask a question about what. So you can say this is important because it shows Montag blank and then finish the sentence. I'm going to continue reading and you can do the quote and get caught up. Let me know if you need help finding where we are. Once upon a time, Beatty said, what kind of talk is that? Fool, thought Montag to himself. He'll give it away. At the last fire, he, a book of fairy tales, he glanced at a single line. I, I, I mean, he said, in, in the old days, before homes were completely fireproofed. And suddenly he seemed much younger voice was speaking for him. And he opened his mouth, Josh, and it was Clarice McClellan saying, didn't firemen prevent fires rather than stoke them up and get them going? <laughs> That's rich. Stoneman and Black drew forth their rule books, which also contained brief histories of the firemen of America, and laid them out for Montag, though long familiar with them, might read. Established 1790 to burn English-influenced books in the colonies. First fireman, Benjamin Franklin. Interesting. Is that, is that a true history? No. Benjamin Franklin is the first fireman, getting a sense of authority based on founding fathers. Faking out the founding fathers. Rule number one, Isaac. Answer the alarm swiftly. Number two, start the fire swiftly. Number three, burn everything. Number four, report back to firehouse immediately. Number five, stand alert for other alarms. Everyone watched Montag. He did not move. And that's when the alarm sounded. The bell in the ceiling kicked itself 200 times. And suddenly there were four empty chairs. The cards fell in a flurry of snow with the brass pole shivered. The men were gone. Montag sat in his chair below the orange dragon, coughed to life, and Montag slid down the pole like a man in a dream. The mechanical hound leapt in his kennel, its eyes all green flame. Hey, Montag, you forgot your hat. He seized it off the wall behind him, ran, leapt, and they were off, the night wind hammering about their siren scream and their metal, mighty metal thunder. We'll stop there because we have an important event coming up which our characters uh, go to a house and it's not going to go as planned. And it's going to be a major event in the rising action of Montag and his development as a questioner and thinker. You guys were good listeners. Everyone put plus one on your notes before you put them away. You don't need to put away your stuff until after we're done here. Yeah, exactly. So you just continue that. So as you do, well, finish up your same matter. I don't think a lot of you got that done. <laughs> By the end of the week on Friday, you're going to have to have six that I'm going to check for an additional 50 points in the system. So make sure that, you know, you can do it right away if you want. Just choose any two quotes from it and talk about it. Right away when we start reading or on your own in the link that I've sent out, the full text, it's at tiny.cc slash m451. You can find this book online, it's free. Tiny.cc slash f451. Fahrenheit. One. Turn on the light for me, please. Make sure that your desks are pushed together, please. So any light right here, can you guys push that desk together? Push those desks together. Make the books all stacked up nicely. No, you guys push your desk, you know. Perfect, guys. Leave. Thank you very much. Bye now. Take care. Take care.